Chapter Thirty Two of Colonel Quaritch, V.C. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Colonel Quaritch, V.C. by H. Ryder Haggart. Chapter Thirty Two. George prophesies again. Six weeks have passed, and in that time several things have happened. In the first place, the miserly old banker Edward Cossey's father had died, his death having been accelerated by the shock of his son's accident. On his will being opened, it was found that property and money, to no less a value than six hundred thousand pounds, passed under it to Edward absolutely. The only condition attached being that he should continue in the house of Cossey and son and leave a certain share of his fortune in the business. Edward Cossey had also, thanks chiefly to Bella's tender nursing, almost recovered. With one exception, he was, and would be for life, stone deaf in the right ear. The paralysis, which the doctors had feared, had not shown itself. One of the first questions, when he became convalescent, was addressed to Bella Quest. He had, as in a dream, always seen her sweet face hanging over him, and dimly known that she was ministering to him. "'Have you nursed me ever since the accident, Bella?' he said. "'Yes,' she answered. "'It is very good of you, considering all things,' he murmured. "'I wonder that you did not let me die.' And she turned her face to the wall, and said never a word, nor did any further conversation on these matters pass between them. Then, as his strength came back, so did his passion for Ida de la Mole revive. He was not allowed to write, or even receive letters, and with this explanation of her silence he was fain to content himself. But the squire, he was told often, called to inquire after him, and once or twice Ida came with him. At length a time came, it was two days after he had been told of his father's death, when he was pronounced fit to be moved into his own rooms, and to receive his correspondence as usual. The move was effected without any difficulty, and here Bella bade him good-bye. Even as she did so, George drove his fat pony up to the door, and, getting down, delivered a letter to the landlady, with particular instructions that it was to be delivered to Mr. Cossey's own hands. As she passed, Bella saw that it was addressed in the squire's handwriting. When it was delivered to him, Edward Cossey opened it with eagerness. It contained an enclosure in Ida's writing, and this he read first. It ran as follows. Dear Mr. Cossey, I am told that you are now able to read letters, so I hasten to write to you. First of all, let me tell you how thankful I am that you are in a fair way to complete recovery from your dreadful accident. And now I must tell you what I fear will be almost as painful to you to read as it is for me to write, namely, that the engagement between us is at an end. To put the matter frankly, you will remember that I rightly or wrongly became engaged to you on a certain condition. That engagement has not been fulfilled. For Mr. Quest, to whom the mortgages on my father's property have been transferred by you, is pressing for their payment. Consequently, the obligation on my part is at an end and with it the engagement must end also, for I grieve to tell you that it is not one which my personal inclination will induce me to carry on. Wishing you a speedy and complete recovery, and every happiness and prosperity in your future life, believe me, dear Mr. Cossey, very truly yours, Ida de la Mole. He put this uncompromising and crushing epistle down, and nervously glanced at the squire's, which was very short. It began. My dear Cossey, Ida has shown me the enclosed letter. I think that you did unwisely when you entered into what must be called a money bargain for my daughter's hand. Whether under all the circumstances she does either well or wisely to repudiate the engagement after it has once been entered into is not for me to judge. She is a free agent and has, of course, a right to dispose of her life as she thinks fit. This being so, I have, of course, no option but to endorse her decision, so far as I have anything to do with the matter. It is a decision which I for some reasons regret, but which I am quite powerless to alter. Believe me, with kind regards, yours truly, James de la Mole. 
Edward Cossey turned his face to the wall and indulged in such meditations as the occasion gave rise to, and they were bitter enough. He was as bent upon this marriage as he had ever been, more so, in fact, now that his father was out of the way. He knew that Ida disliked him. He had known that all along, but he had trusted to time and marriage to overcome the dislike. And now that accursed quest has brought about the ruin of his hopes. Ida had seen her chance to escape, and had, like a bold woman, seized upon it. There was one ray of hope, and only one. He knew that the money would not be forthcoming to pay off the mortgages. He could see, too, from the tone of the squire's letter, that he did not altogether approve of his daughter's decision. And his father was dead. Like Caesar, he was the master of many legions, or rather of much money, which is as good as legions. Money can make most paths smooth to the feet of the traveller, and why not this? After much thought, he came to a conclusion. He would not trust his chance to paper. He would plead his cause in person. So he wrote a short note to the squire, acknowledging Ida's and his letter, and saying that he hoped to come and see them as soon as ever the doctor would allow him out of doors. Meanwhile, George, having delivered his letter, had proceeded upon another errand. Pulling up the fat pony in front of Mr. Quest's office, he alighted and entered. Mr. Quest was disengaged, and he was shown straight into the inner office, where the lawyer sat, looking more refined and gentlemanlike than ever. "'How do you do, George?' he said cheerily. "'Sit down. What is it?' "'Well, sir,' answered that lugubrious worthy, as he awkwardly took a seat. "'The question is, what isn't it? "'These be rum times, they be. "'They fare to puzzle a man, they do.' "'Yes,' said Mr. Quest, "'balancing a quill-pen on his finger. "'The times are bad enough.' "'Then came a pause. "'Dash it all, sir,' went on George presently. "'I may as well get it out. "'I have come to speak to you about the squire's business.' "'Yes,' said Mr. Quest. "'Well, sir,' went on George, I am told that these mortgages have passed into your hands, and that you have called in the money. Yes, that is correct, said Mr. Quest again. Well, sir, the fact is that the squire can't get the money. It can't be had, no how. Nobody won't take the land as security. It might be so much water for all people will look at it. Quite so. Land is in very bad order, as security now. And that being so, sir, what is to be done? Mr. Quest shrugged his shoulders. I do not know. If the money is not forthcoming, of course I shall, however unwillingly, be forced to take my legal remedy. Meaning, sir? Meaning that I will bring in an action for foreclosure and do what I can with the lands. George's face darkened. And that reads, sir, that the squire and Miss Delamole will be turned out of Honham, where they have been for centuries, and that you will turn in? "'Well, that is what it comes to, George. "'I am sincerely sorry to press the squire, "'but it is a matter of thirty thousand pounds, "'and I am not in a position to throw away thirty thousand pounds.' "'Sir,' said George, rising in indignation, "'I do not know how you came by them there mortgages. "'There is some things that lawyers know, and honest men don't know, "'and that is one of them. "'But it seems that you've got them and are going to use them, "'and that being so, Mr. Quest,' I have something to say to you, and that is that no good will will come to you from this move. What do you mean by that, George? said the lawyer sharply. Never you mind what I mean, sir. I mean what I say. I mean that some people has things in their lives, snugged away where nobody can't see them, things as quiet as though they was dead and buried, and that ain't dead or buried. Things so much alive that they fare as though they were fit to kick the lid off their coffin. "'That's what I mean, sir, and I mean that when folks set to work to do a hard and wicked thing, those dead things sometimes gets up and walks where they's least wanted. And mayhap, if you goes on to turn the squire and Miss Ida out of the castle, mayhap, sir, something of that sort will happen to you. For mark my word, sir, there's justice in the world, sir, as mayhap you will find out. And now, sir, I'll wish you good morning, and leave you to consider what I have said.' And he was gone." "'George!' called Mr. Quest after him, rising from his chair. "'George!' but George was out of hearing. 
Now what did he mean by that? What the devil did he mean? Said Mr. Quest with a gasp as he sat down again. Surely, he thought, the man cannot have got hold of anything about Edith. Impossible. Impossible. If he had, he would have said more. He would not have confined himself to hinting. That would take a cleverer man. He would have shown his hand. He must have been speaking at random, to frighten me, I suppose. By heavens, what a thing it would be if he got hold of something. Ruin, absolute ruin. I'll settle up this business as soon as I can and leave the country. I can't stand the strain. It's like having a sword over one's head. I've half a mind to leave it in somebody else's hands and go at once. No, for that would look like running away. It must be all rubbish. How could he know anything about it? So shaken was he, however, that though he tried once and yet again, he found it impossible to settle himself down to work till he had taken a couple glasses of sherry from the decanter in the cupboard. And even as he did so, he wondered, if the shadow of the sword disturbed him so much, how he would be affected if ever it were his lot to face the glimmer of its naked blade. No further letter came to Edward Cossey from the castle, but, impatient as he was to do so, another fortnight elapsed before he was able to go up to see Ida and her father. At last, one fine December morning, he was, for the first time since his accident, allowed to take carriage exercise, and his first drive was to Honham Castle. When the squire, who was sitting in the vestibule writing letters, saw a poor, pallid man, rolled up in fur, with a white face scarred with shot marks, and black rings round his large, dark eyes, being helped from a closed carriage. He did not know who it was, and called to Ida, who was passing along the passage, to tell him. Of course she recognized her admirer instantly, and wished to leave the room, but her father prevented her. "'You got into this mess,' he said, forgetting how and for whom she got into it, and now you must get out of it in your own way.' When Edward, having been assisted into the room, saw Ida standing there, all the blood in his wasted body seemed to rush for a few seconds into his pallid face. "'How do you do, Mr. Cossey? she said. "'I am glad to see you out, and hope that you are better.' "'I beg your pardon. I cannot hear you,' he said, turning round. "'I am stone deaf in my right ear.' A pang of pity shot through her heart. Edward Cossey, feeble, dejected, and limping from the jaws of death, was a very different being to Edward Cossey in the full blow of his youth and health and strength. Indeed, so much did his condition appeal to her sympathies that, for the first time since her mental attitude towards him had been one of entire indifference, she looked on him without repugnance. Meanwhile her father had shaken him by the hand and led him to an armchair before the fire, then, after a few questions and answers as to his accident and merciful recovery, there came a pause. At length he broke it. I have come to see you both, he said with a faint and nervous smile, about the letters you wrote me. If my condition would have allowed it, I would have come before, but it would not. Yes, said the squire attentively, while Ida folded her hands in her lap and sat still with her eyes fixed upon the fire. It seems, he went on, that the old proverb has applied to my case, as to so many others. Being absent, I have suffered. I understand from these letters that my engagement to you, Ida, is broken off. She made a motion of assent, and that it is to be broken off on the ground that, having been forced by a combination of circumstances, which I cannot enter into, to transfer the mortgages to Mr. Quest, "'consequently that I broke my bargain with you.' "'Yes,' said Ida. "'Very well, then. "'I come to tell you both "'that I am ready to find the money "'to meet those mortgages "'and pay them off.' "'Ah,' said the squire. "'Also that I am ready to do "'what I offered to do before, "'and which, as my father is now dead, "'I am perfectly in a position to do, "'namely to settle two hundred thousand pounds "'absolutely upon Ida, "'and indeed do anything else that she or you may wish. And he looked at the squire. It is no use looking at me for an answer, 
said he, with some irritation, I have no voice in the matter. He turned to Ida, who put her hand before her face and shook her head. Perhaps, said Edward somewhat bitterly, I should not be far wrong if I said that Colonel Quaritch has more to do with your change of mind than the fact of the transfer of these mortgages. She dropped her hand and looked him full in the face. You are quite right, Mr. Cossey, she said boldly. Colonel Quaritch and I are attached to each other, and we hope one day to be married. Confound that fellow Quaritch, growled the squire. Edward winced visibly at this outspoken statement. Ida, he said, I make one last appeal to you. I am devoted to you with all my heart, so devoted that though it may seem foolish to say so, especially before your father, I really think that I would rather not have recovered from my accident than that I should have recovered for this. I will give you everything that a woman can want, and my money will make your family what it was centuries ago, the greatest in the countryside. I don't pretend to have been a saint. Perhaps you may have heard something against me in that way, or to be anything out of the way. I am only an ordinary, everyday man, but I am devoted to you. Think then, before you refuse me altogether. I have thought, Mr. Cossey, answered Ida, almost passionately. I have thought, until I am sick of thinking, and I do not think that it is fair that you should press me like this, especially before my father. Then, he said, rising with difficulty, I have said all that I have to say, and done all that I can do. I shall still hope that you may change your mind. I shall not yet abandon hope. Good-bye. She touched his hand, and then, the squire offering him his arm, he went down the steps to his carriage. I hope, Mr. de la Mole, he said, that bad as things are for me, if they should take a turn, I shall have your support. My dear sir, answered the squire, I tell you frankly that I wish my daughter would marry you. As I said before, I have nothing against you, and it would, for obvious reasons, be desirable. But Ida is not like ordinary women. When she sets her mind upon a thing, she sets it like a flint. Things may change, however, and that is all I can say. Yes, if I were you, I should remember that this is a changeable world, and that women are the most changeable things in it. When the carriage had gone, he re-entered the vestibule. Ida, who was going away, much disturbed in mind, saw him coming, and knew from the expression of his face that there was going to be trouble. With characteristic courage, she turned, determined to face it out. End of chapter 32